Greetings my friends, how are you doing? This is Zeb from Zed Outdoors and I hope you're having an awesome day. So today I've come down to see a good friend of mine, Peter Kovac of Soulwood Creations. Peter, how are you doing? Very good, thank you, how are you doing? Well, I appreciate you having me down. Now, in case you're not familiar with Peter, Peter is originally from Hungary. Yep. He's been in the UK for 12 years, living here full time now with his family. Um, originally lived in London. Yes. And now living in beautiful West Yorkshire, which is where we're forming at today. Now, in case you're not familiar with Peter in terms of solar creations, Peter is a full time tool maker as well as a green woodworker. His work is widely respected, and his speciality with the tool maker is more the axes. Uh, yeah. that he makes. They're very revered. They're used by a lot of the spoon carvers that are quite renowned in our community and again and gaining more and more popularity as time goes on. So what we're doing, this video that you're watching now is a beginning of a mini part series that I'm filming with Peter during my stay here in West Yorkshire. And in this particular video, we're going to be looking at Peter's entire process from start to finish on how he carves a wooden spoon. Not only is he an amazing tool maker, but he carves some beautiful spoons as well. Yeah. Now, what makes Peter a little bit unique compared to a lot of other spoon carvers I know is in terms of your career and your background, is actually in furniture design. Yeah. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, furniture making and furniture design as well. So just so I'm understanding this and for the audience to understand, you studied initially in Hungary, is that correct? Yes, yeah, so I studied furniture making in Hungary. And then when I came over to England, I did a full-time university course on furniture and product design. Oh, fantastic. So you bring a lot of that expertise into what it is you do now then? Yeah, it's very much influenced how I approach my work. Fantastic. So here's what's going to be happening, guys. A couple of things. Number one, um, in terms of the actual process from start to finish that Peter's going to be demonstrating now in the rest of this video, if you look along the timeline of this video, you'll see timestamps and those are marking out the various sections of the entire process. You see a lot of these videos that I do, including this one with Peter, is hopefully going to be a reference material for you to emulate and kind of get inspired by Peter's process. So if you want to jump to a particular section as you move forward, you can do that by clicking on the timestamp alongside this video. There's also timestamps marked below in the description just underneath this video. Secondly, what Peter's very kindly done, he said he can provide a downloadable template for the spoon he's going to be demonstrating in this video. And that's going to be available for free. And a link to that will also be down below in the description. So here's what we're going to be doing in this video. We're going to be looking at a few examples of Peter's spoons. And then we're going to get straight into the process where Peter from start to finish is going to be showing you his entire process. So with your kind permission, I think we get started. Let's crack on. So without further ado, guys, I hope you enjoyed the rest of this video where Peter Kovac of Soulwood Creations is going to be showing you how to carve a spoon. So Peter, we have a small selection of spoons that you carved here. Um, just before we have a look at them, are there particular styles of spoon you prefer to carve? Um, not really. It's usually to do with uh, what I prefer at the time. Is there like a certain shape or certain design I really like? I chase them for a while and then I get bored and I move to something a bit more exciting. And so, uh, so are you quite playful and creative with the styles of spoons that you do? Uh, I wouldn't say I'm really extravagant. I, I like to try new things, but I don't go crazy. I don't think so, I do. Um, yeah, just always what I, what I enjoy carving, I think that's the most important. So in terms of the selection you have here, I think we'll start on the far end here. Uh, would you like to talk about the spoon at the end here? Uh, yeah, so this one is a yoga spoon. Um, I think it's a really nice bit of plum I had. Um, and it's just yellow because of the linseed oil I used. But I really liked how cleanly it carves. So you get all the nice, really sharp details on the facets. So when you can, you have a really hard species of wood to work, it's really nice to have all your details really nice and crisp and it really shows. Um, yeah, the sum of it, this one is a um, pickle spoon. So the holes is for the, have all the pickle juice to flow through and just have all the good stuff left in there. Um, and I think it's uh, similar to Lee Stoffer's gem spoon design. So this corner is good to get the gem out of the corner of the jar as well. But I do all sorts of different designs, eating spoons, uh, serving spoons. So this one is a Hawthorne. We use this pretty much every time we do some like nice roast and every, 
other type of dishes. That's why it's all used, so it needs a bit of oil in. Uh, I have another yogurt spoon, we use this every day as well. This one, one of the first one I ever carved. Um, it definitely shows, you can see on the neck. But it's just cherishing it as part of my journey and it just keeps me humble in a way, where I came from. Um, what else is there? Yes, yeah, a milk painted one. So at the moment I really enjoy this sort of design for the actual bowl of the spoon. Uh, this is again just highlighting the facets on the milk paint. There was a time I really enjoyed um, carving these um, basket beef. So basically it started as a co rosing and it went terribly wrong so I ended up chip carving it and it actually looks really nice. So I really enjoy how this spoon flows in general and then this hollow little facets on the back. So I really enjoy this. This is one of my daily spoons I use. And what else we got in here? Got some oak spoon. This is a really simple shape, but this is for was for me an exercise to really try to nail down the design and how it actually looks the spoon rather than putting on fancy chip carving or anything. Um, this is a pasta serving spoon. I'm gonna start it as a ladle, but it was too small for that, so I tried to rescue it by drilling some holes and then carve it into a pasta spoon, which has worked out quite nicely. We have a serving spoon, this is an oak as well, uh, and I mimic the same hollow facets on the back of this smaller spoon with a nice little hook on the back. Um, this one, this huge one, it's an ebonized sycamore. This is um, a cooking spoon, but this is for the Bograch, we call it in Hungary. Basically it's an iron cauldron and that's what we tend to use for cooking outdoors. Uh, and it's just this ebonizing process I kind of experimented with. Created this like metallic, really shiny finish on it. So why did I heat it up between the um, ebonizing coats I put in the oven and it resulted in this quite interesting finish. Uh, and this one is another rescue. This is my wife's favorite um, yogurt spoon. So it had a, a crack in the bowl and I tried to rescue it but it became too thin so I just wrapped some cord around it, some natural cord. It doesn't look very nice but it's something like a charm to it which I really like. And I have some uh, uh, spatula. So again it's just a little bit more exciting than just a straight um, handle on the spatula. So Peter, we're going to start off with the acting and before we do that, we're going to have wood selection, what wood you're going to be carving with. Just before we do that, I wanted to touch on these beautiful chairs we were sitting on. Hmm. So these are ones you've made yourself then? Uh, yes, so I made these with uh, William St. Clair in Brookhouse Wood. So this one was the first one I made um, because I obviously have a bit of a background in woodworking it, and green woodworking especially. It turned out really nice and I absolutely fell in love with the whole process of using, you know, no wood glue, but just using the shrinkage of the wood and how light and how sturdy and flexible this whole chair becomes just because it's used clean green ash. It's amazing. And what's the seat made from? So this is a weaved uh, like paper cord. This is beautiful, so, so nice. And yeah. a smaller one here then? Oh yeah, so this is a part of two. Uh, this is, was the second time I, I went around and I wanted to make two chairs in the same week. Uh, this one is painted with milk paint uh, just to make it a little bit pop. And again, steam vent slats on the back as well. I just really love, enjoy love the process and they are such beautiful objects. They're happy to have them in, in the house and around the table. So I'd rather sit, them, sit on them than anything else, really. Amazing. So with the wood selection, what are we going to be looking at then? Yeah, so this is my wood pile here. Um, again, it's always a good idea to keep them covered. Uh, so it's good if a little, little bit of air goes through. But again, you want to preserve it from the rain. So this one is, um, I think it's a sort of cherry probably like some sort of hybrid came down just from the corner because it was diseased so it had to come down. Uh, this one is laburnum which is poisonous so I would not recommend to carve a spoon from it however if you just have a look at the grain uh, the color is just amazing so these will make lovely tool handles and all sorts of other ornamental pieces. Um, so these logs are ash, this one and this one, so these will be chairs or some sort of furniture at one point. I think this one is pear, uh, 
and it looks really nice. I haven't tried this one yet, but probably would be quite interesting. Birch, um, and this is more laburnum. This one is a bit of beech, but what I wanted to use is this bit of cherry. It's been here for a while, probably about three, four months, uh, but actually it just carves really nicely. Uh, you see the growth rings are quite big, so it's grown really fast. Uh, but I think if we, obviously the outside is a little bit dry, but if you tack into the middle of it and then cut off the two ends, it should make a lovely spoon. And in terms of wood selection, just before we move on to the actual processing, um, do you have preferences in terms of the wood that you uh, like to carve with? I think, I think what I prefer is actually hardwood because you can have a lot nicer, cleaner finish on it. But it's always rare within wood species as well. I can have really gnarly, horrible cherry or or a beech, but you can have really nice older, which is a little bit softer. So it's basically up to the piece of wood you're using and let's try to make the best of it, really. So Peter, what are we gonna do first? Um, well, we will split this uh, nice bit of cherry up. Um, what I tend to use is a really unglorified uh, Fiskars X. Basically, it's cheap. It's readily available and it's, you can beat it up. You see the edge is pretty done already, but you can really abuse this and I'm not gonna you know, cry over it if anything happens to it. So for a splitting axe, this is perfect. Um, and really, I just need to select what would be a nice um, area of this spoon. Obviously this slug bin crawling over it. You see here some cracks began as it started drying. So I would say the outside is protected relatively by the bark. So probably this section would be quite nice. So it's really straight grained, you see on the side, and quite short. So I should split fairly straight, even if I'm not splitting it in half as I would usually do. So I think I will start by splitting it here and just having ready to go spoon blanks out of it, hopefully. My trusty gnarly bit of piece of wood for splitting. So when I'm splitting, always having the X handle is 90 degree to you. So even if the X falls through after the split, it's not going to hit you. So it's always a good uh, habit to get into. So I'm going to remove this out a bit uh, and then I'm gonna go even further in. So just make sure we're trying to get the best part. So because it's quite a large piece of wood, I need to do several cuts to start the split and then we'll see what happens after. So you see on the outside, the bark is usually holding it together on cherry, it's quite a sturdy little piece. So this is what we're going to look at once we get to there. So it's quite nice. It's been matured <laughs> like a good wine for a while. So I think it will be quite nice once we get to the uh, actual bit we need. So... So... Um, the growth rings obviously going like so. So you can think about how you're going to position your spoon. Um, if you want a you know, radial split or perpendicular split, well, I will just have a straight section and I will have a variety of grain orientation within that. So about the width of a spoon and a bit of an extra. So I think something like this will be perfect. So let's hope. I'm not gonna whack your camera. Just a few more, so make sure we get a golden split. Yeah, that's in. I think we need to go through now, no way back. Maybe I was a little bit too ambitious with this, so 
what I'm going to do, I'm going to bring out another axe. See, this is my bushcrafting axe, which I'm also not so sorry for. I'm just going to put it here. So what I'm doing, because I started another split from here, it opens up the wood a little bit and this should free the fiscars as well. I'd rather hold them to this one. If this one falls to the ground, I'm not so worried about that. There you go. All right. And then finish off. So again, you see in the end, the bark was holding it together. So I'm gonna, I could have done it before. You can just basically peel off the bark. And this will give us a nice, voila. So this golden color is quite, it's obviously started to decay, but it will make a lovely spoon. So now, because I have quite a large, you know, to work with, what I'm going to do, I'm going to split it up to several pieces. So it will give me about four or five spoon blanks which will be lovely. There's one. There's two. And then here we get the um, this nice color change. I'm not sure if it's because of the change of the softwood to hardwood from, I mean, the, the cambium. But let's try to incorporate that into a spoon. I'm gonna split it off here. So even at this stage, you're looking at efficiency in terms of getting the most out of the wood that you have. Yes, and you know, there are some wood species that I would be like, you know, whatever. Well, this is a quite nice cherry. This will probably make another two. But you know, it's just, if it's so easy to split, so straight, if it would be a gnarly bit of whatever branch, then I wouldn't be so precious, but this just splits so nicely. So make the best out of it, really. So we got four or five out of this one piece. Probably with these off cuts, I could do something, but like another spoon probably come out of it. But again, it could be, you know, full of split so I'm not sure we might see at some point if I can make something out of it. So Peter what's next in the process? Um, so now we have our blank. Uh, what I'm going to do because it's pretty much as you see a square um, I'm going to clean up this surface here and you know, cut in the crank carve the crank in and then we decide on the spoon design. Perfect so this elegantly brings us the opportunity to start introducing some of your tools and obviously you're known for your soulwood creations axe. Yes. So do you want to talk a little bit about the axe you have now? Yeah, so this axe is not fully representative of my work, it's representative of the work I've done in the past. So this handle is a really old handle but you can see by the patina it's been used a lot. So this is a number two carving axe I make. Uh, and again, it's not a final finished product, but this is obviously I left with the leftover usually. Um, but what my handles really feature is a faceted recurve handle, uh, a really nice hand forged uh, axe head, and a proud, this is extreme, this is for my everyday use, a proud wedge which is not glued in, so you can remove it anytime or tighten it if it comes to it. Uh, and the hand stitched uh, leather sheath. Again, this is uh, just a <laughs> it didn't make the cut, so I ended up with it. Uh, but again, I hopefully get to introduce you to my proper nice finished products as well. But these are really nice carving as I use it daily. So, uh, and so just a couple of things that the audience may, may not be familiar with is in terms of the origins of the axe head itself, where are they forged? Where are they typically made? Yeah, so these axe heads are forged in Hungary by a uh, blacksmith named Sabo András, who's living next the next village where I used to live in and um, through a lucky discovery I found out about him 
and we start discussing making some prototypes and he forges the different types of axe heads for me. It's a spring steel so it's quite, uh, uh, could be abused quite a bit. Uh, yeah. And leading on from that, um, obviously in my visit here now to see you, um, we're going to be filming a couple of videos on axe handles itself, aren't we, yes. solely? So, just as a teaser for you guys, the first video we're going to be looking at axe handle ergonomics. And that, I guess, entails what you think makes a good axe handle, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So, obviously I've been doing this for a while. Uh, I experimented a lot and I made, you know, hundreds of handles. So it came to kind of like distill down to uh, certain principles where I think they make a good carving axe handle and a good carving axe as a consequence. So we will talk about that and we'll share you with my deepest, most kept secrets. And then leading on from that, we're going to do a, se uh, an, a second video in that axe making series where you're very kindly going to be teaching from start to finish how to take a raw piece of wood and make and attach an axe handle, is that correct? That's correct, yes. Yeah. So hopefully if we, I will talk you through how to choose the right species, the right piece of wood and then how to go through the whole process of carving an axe handle and fitting an axe head. Awesome. Well. So if those videos are already out by the time you're watching this, check the links below in the description and you can go check those out. So Peter, getting straight into the axe work right here and now, where are you going to begin? Well, I'm going to remove the sheath from the block so I don't chop it in half. Um, so as I said before, it's not always the case, but luckily here I ended up with a relatively you know, rectangular uh, piece of wood, which is going to be my spoon blank. and. Uh, to bring your hole into a nice rectangular piece, I'm going to clear this surface off. So I'm going to make some relief cuts first. So I'm just going to talk about the axe and how I use it as well. Uh, at this stage when I do roughing work, my hand just slides down to the end. So you can get the most leverage from the axe. This is a 500 gram axe head. The whole axe is about weight about 750 gram. So it's not considered as a heavy axe, but because of the ergonomics and the handle, it can really just pack a punch and really can go to town with it. So you see you got some splits there but shouldn't be an issue. I flipped around here in the halfway round because it's just when you do such heavy blows it's easier and a lot safer to keep it not so close to your hand so halfway is about the safe bet so I'm not aiming for an absolutely straight surface because I'm going to cut the ends off here because there will be splits starting because it's been a, an old piece of wood so there will be splits on the end so I'm going to cut this off cut this off and I'm going to try to keep it as nice and straight as possible so I'm going to move on to my saw so this saw is a Tajima saw um, it's a lot cheaper, probably like a third of the price of a silky saw but I would say nearly just as good obviously a little bit lower quality but it really does the job I think it's about 20 pound oh wow so it should be really cheap and cheerful so I'm going to cut my line in for the crank of the spoon what are we looking at so it's quite deep this cut but I'm going to remove some of this area on the top to make this surface a little bit curved so I'm making a pre-crank in the way so at this point here I'm just going straight down but I'm loosening my grip on the axe so it's kind of start bouncing outwards and you see here I have no trouble going through this cut here and just splitting off the end I'm going to repeat this just one more time so my really deep cut is not so deep anymore 
and now I'm going to put in the actual crank, the main crank in a way. Yep, so I'm gonna flip to this side, I'm going to start axing out the ball area of the spoon. This is the part when this upsweep on the X really comes to play because you can really easily get to this area on the spoon blank with this upsweep. The other tip as well in here, if you keep this side really nice and straight, if you split in any other way, because we were quite lucky, you can always just straighten it out, flatten it. So when you put it down, it's nice and stable, it's not so wobbly, so you have a nice straight surface like that. And when I get to the axing out this ball area here, I'm a little bit changing my stance, so I'm spreading my legs a little bit wider, so I can also bend my knees, so I get nice, basically I'm above my piece, so I can really see what I'm doing. And when I start axing, it's a good tip, if you can ever so slightly tip your blank, so you can kind of have it in line with you. And I start from the bottom, come up to the top. If you're inexperienced, you can, this is a really good technique, just creeping up on it. And then establish your final cut, which is this one here. And just proceeding downwards. You see all of these pieces come away. And then again, you can use the very tip of the axe to clear this out. So when I tip, tip, tip it just ever so slightly, and I drop my body even further down, and I get to the cut. So we have a nice clear crank in here. And then now I can start drawing on my spoon design. So at this stage we have the crank axed in uh, to our blank. Uh, this is, will be the stage for me when I start drawing up the, the design of my spoon. Um, I usually use templates because it allows me to really focus on the technique, the carving technique I'm using. Obviously the spoon carving world is divided by two, so the people who are using uh, spoon, spoon templates, some of it, uh, so we're exclusively using templates and then the other people really enjoy a free flow, their sketches or drawings. I like to mix and match, but I really like the comfort the spoon template gives me. The, you can repeat a really nice design over and over again without having to worry about it. Um, so there is a spoon I really enjoy carving lately. I'm going to use the bowl of this template, which is a modified template. Um, and what I would like to end up with I carved this spoon here and uh, the ball is not so much, it's a nice shape but not as good to use but I really enjoyed the handle shape and design it has a nice bit of a recurve to it uh, so but I really enjoy carving and using these sort of ball shapes so what I try to do, I try to match the two together so I'm gonna have this handle and this ball on it so in order to do that, I'm going to start with the center line. Which I will use this flexible ruler. Well, this is uh, a tricky part because many people struggle to find the right equipment to draw on green wood. Uh, by chance, I come across, um, which I can't find, there you go, uh, this gel pen, which is a classmate gel pen. And this is, for some reason, is draws on green wood, which is uh, which is unexplainable. Uh, so, just roughly pick a center point. So, just dividing this distance by half. This is a bit of a flexible ruler, but not too flexible. But it's just good to pick up the shape. So, obviously you can decide if we will be a left-handed or a right-handed use. I tend to cater for our right-handed people in the world. 
um, and I'm just going to draw around just a ball yep that's happy I'm happy with that and then I'm going to have a look at the spoon which I like the design of well it does appear to yeah here we are so I'm trying to match basically a copy of this but with a larger ball so I have two options I'll either draw around it but try to mimic the shape for the ease I will just draw around it this will be just a rough guidance anyway as I'm carving this will change oops this will change a lot anyway so this is what we're looking at so yeah I have the template of my spoon shape actually drawn up as you can see I've got plenty of material all, all around so I'm going to thin it down from the side profile and then I will tackle the actual top view the reason why I'm starting on here when I'm trying to X out the side profile it will be a lot easier because I'm going to have a lot less material to deal with you see here I also moved it further in so if there any cracks start to go from the end you can just cut it clear off so yeah, I'm gonna start axing on the back this will be fairly straightforward when I'm axing down the back of the ball I'm keeping my axe always chopping from top down vertically and I'm going to move my actual spoon blank this will keep it a lot safer a lot better axe technique have a look yeah so I'm keeping the apex in the same line as the bottom of my crank and when I get to axe the back I've got loads of material here so I'm going to take some facets off on either side making some relief cuts so instead of have to remove this much material I don't need to deal with this much and obviously we'll widen but it just makes your life a little bit easier uh, top tip from me um, when you're holding so when you're axing out your spoon blank you want to keep everything nice and parallel the top the bottom and the sides with each other everything nice and square when you're axing the back it's quite easy to twist out of that flat surface so i'm holding my forefinger on the bottom of it and this gives me i'm tucking away my thumb here gives me a nice indication of what's the orientation of that flat surface is so when i'm axing here this will tell me what kind of plane of axing I'm looking at so you know obviously I can twist it so I'm trying to keep it nice and parallel again the relief cuts when I get close to the one third it gets a little bit tricky so make sure your thumb is nicely tucked away so I have still plenty of material left So in here I'm not worried about being really thin, this whole thing, section will be cut off. So now I'm going to remove some of the side profile. I'm going straight down, just roughly the width of the spoon and a bit of an extra material. Do the same thing on the other side. See here now, you can really clearly see how much material I've got here. So I can really go down a little bit more, thin it down. Again, I'm going to use the same technique I did before. I'm going to take off some from the side. Not much, just a little bit. Good. 
so that's looking good now I'm going to get my saw out cut off the ends and I'm gonna make some relief cuts to the side yes top tip for everyone who's carving a spoon please do not use your axe to wipe off your block you spend so much time to keep it nice and sharp so instead of just as you're carving wiping it off don't do it just use your block or the blank use your hand to wipe it off make it nice and clean don't use your axe it's uh, the spoon guards will frown upon you so cut off one end cut off the other one so I'm using my thumb as a fence or as a guide so you can't really cut yourself obviously it's bracing it on the side of the blade and then once you started the cut you can remove your thumb straightforward very easy this is a trick from a furniture making background um, when I make my cut on the side I'm trying to find the deepest point on the handle this is like a neck transition so I'm gonna make my cut here and repeat it on the other side go a little bit closer a little bit closer here Oops. I have still way too much material sideways but I'm going to take this facet off, make it a bit larger so it's easier to carve out the side profile it's going to be a lovely piece of wood hopefully make a lovely spoon Then I'm gonna do it a little bit on the side as well. Um, so see, I carried on with the same facet on the side as well. Good, I'm happy with that. And now we can start on the side. So you see, I still try to keep everything nice and square. It's always going to help you to determine the actual profile of your spoon so if you look from the side because it's not rounded off it's really easy to tell how the shape goes and going to be the same principles goes when you do the top view if you keep it nice and square you, all your line will be really nice and crisp you will be able to tell where you are and where you need to remove material from so you can start from the end here so I'm using the very tip of the X and I'm choking up on the X so I can have nice controlled cuts if you don't feel confident to go really close to the line you can just do roughly close to the line and if you have like a nice recurve like on this axe you can use this guillotine cut to get to literally right to the line and then on the other side I'm going to do the same thing And then when you go here, you see the grain is basically running right out from here across the ball. So when you're axing this bit, you need to make sure your spoon blank is nice and supported. So there's two ways of doing it. You can tilt it quite a bit and then try to ax downwards. Or you can just put the ax in position and drop it down using the own weight of the ax. Again, it's not right to the line, but you can use these guillotine cuts again basically you're rocking the axe back and forth right to the line you need that for that quite a nice sharp axe so yeah so once the top profile is done you see I try to keep it nice and square so you can see the profile really nicely I'm going to start axing down here and I'm going to meet at the bottom So I'm creeping up on that line I drew up. Just levering 
away it's quite nice to remove the wood chips um, because this one has a quite tight curve here I'm just gonna go straight on and meet in that line and then now I can come from the other side in here I'm gonna use this butt cut so I'm gonna lift up my ball uh, my spoon blank same with the X and I just drop it down so it's the splits just runs through you can go quite close with this so the biggest risk I have here is my X running through into the ball and starts to split then again only probably going to find out once you nearly finish with the spoon as it usually happens and then you're gonna start sparing so and when I'm axing here I'm gonna keep it nice and safe I'm gonna show you in a second but because this is the top of a hill so I'm gonna ax down here and I'm gonna ax down there always axing downhill This, this here, I'm using the beard of the axe. Again, I'm choking up on the axe, and this is the, when the beard becomes really useful. You have loads of control. The cutting edge is right in front of your hand. So if I drop it in position, and I also keep it in a bit of an angle, so as I drop it in, it really creates this really nice slicing motion. So you can have loads of control and loads of fun. And again, when I get close to this cut I made with the saw, just do some butt cut, like dropping it to the X block, and I can have a nice cut there. So I'm going to leave it at this for now. I'm going to go back with the X to clear it up a little bit, but do the other side. I'm going to brace this kind of V-shape on the edge of my block. It's not like so. so you see I just went straight on either side. I do the same thing on this side. of the X. I mean really gentle heel here and then I can do the same thing on the other side as well. Good. So then now I have this little of a issue here with this really tight curve. So I can go quite steep in with my axe and create a V-shape there. But first I'm going to remove some of this material because it's extremely thick. I'm going to meet, leave some meat there so I have a nice opportunity with the knife to carve this nice curve in here. So if I go really close then I might you know have a miss blow with the axe and I will be really crippling my opportunities there. Um, so on the side profile it's still really thick. I'm going to remove some more material. The more I remove with the axe the easier my life will get when I get to the knife work. So I'm tilting my spoon instead of the axe. I'm chopping downwards. And I'm happy with that. Now I'm gonna bring down the sides. Happy days. See here in the back I have loads of material still. So I'm just going to look down from the top. I 
I'm leaving the handle a little bit thicker than I would usually do because I'm going to use my spoon knife to, well actually no, my carving knife to create a nice little curvature in here as well. So I'm leaving it a little bit thicker. If I'm leaving my spoon blank like this, I'm quite happy with. Um, it's still a little bit thicker places, but I would just tackle it with the knife. It's quicker and easier for me. It's a lot safer in terms of not having a miss blow with the axe. So now I'm going to move on to the knife work. Um, this is one of the knives I um, made. So the blade made by Josh over at Greenhaven Forge. This is a super long sloyd, a sloyd katana in a way. And this is one of the designs I quite enjoy using. It's quite big and bulky, but it's really nice to do the really big cuts with this. So I'm gonna use this. And just to kind of touch on, just as we did with the axe, Obviously, based on logistics and time in my visit right here now to see you, sure. all being well, we are going to be filming a two-part series on the knife handle as well, aren't we? Yes, correct. So, part one, we're going to be looking at knife handle ergonomics, very similar to the axe handles, where Peter's going to be talking about, obviously, an optimal uh, handle shape and whatnot. And also, in that second part of that particular series, we're going to be looking at actually making a knife handle from scratch. Is that correct? Yes. Hopefully that will uh, work out really nicely. Um, so with this one, it's not my particular design I do, but um, something I really enjoy using. So, but back to the spoon. Um, now I'm just, what I'm going to do is to clean up the profile of my spoon. So because I kept everything nice and square, it's really easy to, for me to see where material needs to be removed. And I'm also going to do the same thing on a side profile. So let's just start here. So what I really enjoy about this long sloyd blade that because obviously it's a very long blade the tip is quite far from the handle which means you have plenty of leverage when you're using the tip that's one of the benefits I really enjoy and the other one is when you making long cuts you can have a really nice kind of slicing action going for you obviously it's, you can do it with the shorter blades as well but sometimes somehow this one just really leads into it so I'm getting the side all nicely cleaned up I'm using the very tip of the knife obviously the less material is behind the edge the easier to turn in really tight corners if you have a lot of material behind the edge the back is hitting the actual spoon so that's why you need to use the tip for this section here I'm going to leave it a little bit rough for now because I'm trying to establish the main shape of the spoon and I, when, I, when we get to it I show you how I tackle the neck which is tend to be quite a tricky bit on your spoon carving journey. See, I went a bit skewed on my saw cut, but hopefully we will get away with it. So I have loads of material here, but I will do this afterwards, because in here, the ball will have a lot lower angle, like a bit of a curve in here. But I need to hollow out this section first. Um, so I'm happy with this. Do the back of the spoon a little bit. Again, all the way until the very end, I'm trying to keep everything nice and square. It will just make your life a hell of a lot easier. And when you put on the facets, if you want to put facets on, it's a lot easier. And you have a really nice sharp corners. Just blending this in. And then rounding this off a little bit. Alright, 
And a little, remove a little bit of material now because. So this chest lever grip. So this is when I really enjoy this knife and generally my designs is, uh, they tend to have a bit of a belly. This is really extreme, so that's why I wouldn't make this for everyone. But this belly sits in your palm beautifully and gives you this really nice kind of like print of your palm. So obviously the muscle group here, the muscle group here sits into these, these two grooves and gives you a really positive grip on your knife which is just extremely enjoyable and this long blade really slices through Yeah, it's a little bit of on the harder end. This cherry is not as green, but still should be really nice. Okay. So I'm starting to establish these two facets on the back, and then this is the highest point. So it should be roughly underneath the crank. Might be pushing a little bit further forward. And then try to have this really nicely blending into the handle. Yeah, so this looks a lot better already. So now I'm trying to put in this kind of sweep in here where I talked about earlier. So I'm just bracing the spoon off my chest and holding with one finger the very tip. I'm using these three fingers to reinforce my cut. So I'm just start from the top, get rid of the, all the rough bits as I progress down. So once I have a smoother surface, I can do nice long cuts. So now I put a little bit of a sweep into the handle. I'm going to make this a bit more pronounced, I think. Pronounced. <laughs> yeah. Funny, I've been living here 12 years, but still. English is a tricky one. All right. So I'm happy with this. So if you look at the profile, it's a nice bit of nice crank, bit of a sweep in the handle. The shape of the of the handle itself from the top view is not quite there just yet, but I'm going to leave it at that. And I'm going to have these guys come off. I'm going to stop here <coughs> because I'm going to hollow out my ball a little bit to tackle the ball itself. So what I will focus on is the rim of the ball and this angle here. It will be a lot easier to carve out if I hollow out most of the material and you only have a little bit of material on the side to remove. So the roughing process I use this corp made by uh, Lee Stofer. It's his design and the blade made by Nick Westerman. Um, I think this is one of the best I use for my spoon. I really enjoy using it because of the versatility. Versatility? That's so, correct. Yeah, <laughs> um, because all of a sudden, if you use it as a left-handed spoon knife, you just flip it over and you can have a right-handed spoon knife. And this area in here is really good for deeper like cooks and whatnot. So it's a really nice tool and made by a really good friend of mine. So it's always a pleasure to use. So because of you know nature of the scope, um, it's allowed me to do stuff I wouldn't be able to do with a single spoon knife. So I'm starting my roughing uh, using as a left-handed spoon knife and I push um, in, with my thumb across the grain and I feel like because I'm having this reinforcement from the, my thumb I can remove quite a bit of material. What I'm being careful of that as I'm pushing through my cut Obviously, if I would push straight on, it would end up in probably my finger. I can hide it, but also what I do, I just turn it out from the cut 
when I get to the certain point I'm happy with. So I can do this section first. I flip you, and now I use it as a right-handed one, and just do it across the grain. So for those that don't have the score, would yeah. I be right in saying they'll just naturally switch between a left and right handed spoon knife? Oh well, they can do this, all this with just one spoon knife. This is a technique I developed because the tools I have available. So you can do this, if let's imagine that this is just a right handed. So you can do this section the same way, right handed spoon knife. And when I'm, when I'm carving, trying to not exit too harshly upwards because then you're going to have a big chunk of material that will be really difficult to carve so you can just pro progress with that cut all the way to the rim so now you see as a use as a right-handed spoon knife and you can just go all the way across the whole bowl but because i have a scope i can just flip it over again and use a different grip and i'm using it as a left-handed knife again and just push about this section here so it's you know unfair on people who don't have a scope but again we use the tools we have available or by any luck of the spoon guards you can get your hands on one of these you develop different style of carving but it just allows me to really quickly flip between a right-handed and a left-handed spoon knife so in terms of readily available, SCORP is always going to be the number one recommendation. Um, in terms of a readily available spoon knife, is there any particular ones that you recommend? Um, depends on your budget and depends on your patience. If, uh, if you have all the time in the world, then obviously sign up for Nick Westerman's website. Um, there's also a more readily available one, which are Robin Wood uh, spoon knives. I think you can get them straight away. Um, they are really nice uh, budget friendly spoon knives and they really do the job perfectly. I think what's important that you get your technique first nailed down so you make sure the tools you're using, the tools you have available, you really nail down the technique. And the moment you realize that the tools are not good enough is because your technique reached a certain point that you actually overgrown uh, your tools and then you can upgrade and maybe while you're doing that you can wait on that uh, waiting list. Spoon, corps, spoon scorps are hard to get as well sadly but again most of these makers are a one-man band like myself and you know we are really sorry that we can't produce thousands of them but uh, they all handcrafted to a really high standard and I like to believe that they worth the wait really. Um, back to the spoon this one here so I've got this neck area here Again, I'm going quite close to the edge with the knife because all of this will be removed. It's really protruding in a way a bit. So this is just a really rough uh, establishing the ball. In the meantime though, I'm really paying attention that the deepest point of my ball is either in the underneath the crank, the deepest point of the crank, or in this one-third section because if you make it really deep at the very end, uh, if it's an eating spoon, it will be really uncomfortable to use. So when you make your eating spoon, I would advise to make on the back of the spoon quite straight and on the ball section quite shallow because that will make the most comfortable eating spoon to use. So now I rough hollowed my uh, spoon ball I'm going to move on to the knife again. Again, you see it's the same uh, handle by having Mora's Frost. This is one of my favorite blades. Uh, they don't make this anymore, um, but I really enjoy it to use. So I'm just, no particular reason, I just, you know, swap with my blades, just keep it fresh, keep it interesting. Uh, and I really enjoy this knife because it's just amazing. So as you see here, if you see this side, it's a really steep angle. So what I want, I want to blend it into the actual deepest point of the crank to have a nice continuous curve here. So I'm gonna start from here and blending it into the deepest point of the crank. In here, the uh, grain direction will change. So you should stop as well when you get to this point and start approaching it from the other side. And I'm using the tip of the knife here, kind of like pulling it, slicing it along. 
sometimes happens that your axe strikes quite deep in this area here so your crank is actually going further deeper you can just take it deeper and deeper and deeper if the crank is too extreme you can always take off some of the material from the tip you know I've got have plenty of material here so now we have a lot nicer curve I'm going to try to mimic this on the other side as well when I'm carving this one I'm dropping my knife from a, like a parallel into a bit of an angle because this will lead into a really nice shape of the ball so you see I had the really rounded ball uh, hollow here but now it comes to a point so it will be really easy to chase this um, the hollowing out of the ball to the rim because I kept everything nice and square let's see how this part here behaves so this is a bit of an unorthodox hold I'm not sure if I do, how the people do it but I just wrap put it in my palm and hold it securely with this pretty much my middle finger and in the end I just brace it from the top and I can still use my thumb to do the push cuts obviously you need to care for in your thumb here so you can hide it underneath it and then careful when the grain direction changes you see I went a little bit deeper with the axe cuts there so I need to go deeper as well with the knife hmm that's it because I had to go quite deep there it's a little bit off compared to the other side all right so as you might can see this curve is not parallel symmetrical to each other because I haven't really worked on them with the knife so this is a good point for me to put the template back on and really finish off the uh, profile of my spoon So you can, you, because it's flexible, you can push it a little bit closer. You can really have the final design on it. Now I just have to find a pen. Probably pushing it a little bit too much. So as you see that's one of the reasons I really enjoy using the template because now I don't have to worry about symmetry or anything because the template will do it for me. It's a little bit lazy but now I can clearly tell where I need to take material off. And it just makes my life a lot quicker and easier. It obviously limits your creative freedom a little bit but it's always a trade-off right across the grain, no messing around and then again, you know, you're going downhill this is the highest spot, if you imagine it's a mountain you always go downhill, go across and then down keeping everything nice and square Alright, so now comes the tricky bit, so making this neck part, so I'm using the very tip of the knife, so you might see that I'm leaving these wood shavings on, because these are kind of an indication how deep I will go from the other side, when I get to this point, I'm hitting these wood shavings from the other side, and I just keep repeating the same process I'm coming down here leaving the wood, shaping, wood shavings on and when I get to this part kind of levering away with my knife so I'm not carrying on with the cut I'm doing the same thing on the other side and I'm kind of lifting it out so I keep creeping underneath it 
So now I need to go underneath these. And then do the same thing on the other side. Until all of a sudden you end up with a really nice smooth transition of the neck. So just again, so I'm going down here and I'm leaving the wood shavings on. I'm using the very tip of the knife and when I get to the end of my cut I kind of lift out, lever out my, uh, my knife instead of leaving it in there. And because doing this I'm kind of starting mini splits going that way. I'm leaving the wood shavings on. I come from the other side and I can see I'm just creeping underneath those wood shavings from the other side by creating new ones. And then now, because I created new ones, I can come from the other side and try to go underneath them or just severing them. And see, so you can have a really nice clean transition, even if the grain direction changes, a really nice clean transition here. Now we just need to go down to the line. Uh, so this is here, and I lift it out. Yeah, this looks good. Flip it over, and I'm trying to creep underneath those shavings. So see, I created new ones from the other side. Just go underneath those. There you go, really nice clean transition. Nice and symmetrical ready to move on to the next section I think which would be the back of the bowl because now I have this nice curve established now I can match the back of the bowl to it I'm just um, get into position for nice chest lever grips so as I mentioned earlier keeping this front section of the bowl nice and straight and flat in a way, we make a lot nicer user experience. And then trying to keep the rim, you see it's get a lot fatter this side, so I try to keep it nice and equally thick or equally thin. Here I've got loads of material. I will go deeper here but I'm pretty sure I won't need this much. Go all the way to this side. I would carve this pin differently if I would like to put in a um, facet on the back, but now I'm just going through a simple, straightforward back of the ball. So that's not too bad. I'm getting the right depth here now and I'm going to blend it to the front. Yeah, it's not too bad. While I'm still leaving these guys here, so I can go to this part will be once I hollow do the final hollow this can really follow the curve of the ball so I'm just doing it so it's roughly the same thickness all the way around so I'm trying to be quite methodical with my carving but sometimes I get distracted. Ooh, that's sticking out. But um, try to keep again everything all the time, nice and square. Don't put too many facets on. You either decide to round the back off already, or just keep a few main facets like I did in the back. It will make your life a little bit easier on the back, on the, on the finishing lines, really. Okay, dogs. So this starts to look now a nice spoon. So I'm quite happy with this. Um, 
Now I will establish my actual the ball, so I'm going to hollow it out to the final, as close to the final finishing um, stage as I can. And then I will melt everything to it. So that will be the grinding principle. So I'm going to go back to my scope to do this section here. I just really enjoy this um, powerful cut with this left-handed way of using it. So I'm going to retain this um, oval like kind of comes to the point shape ball. I quite enjoy that. So if I do, um, if you want to go deep on your eating spoon, this is a good part to, you know, gain the depth. As I said, on the end, it's nice to keep it nice and shallow. So if you, you know, want to eat soups and whatnot with it. So now I'm trying to match the thickness of the rim on either side. This is not a final carving because cherry is prone uh, to oxidization so it reacts with the air. So once I dry this as close to your finish as I can and I leave it and it will change um, color and will, you know, like here you already can see it start. Maybe from the dirt from my hands but it will oxidize and pick a different color. So I'm going to recarve once it's bone dry uh, and then get to the final finishing shape and surface. Yeah, I'm happy with that. And then at this stage, usually I switch to my right-handed finishing blade on my Nick Westerman. Obviously, Peter has a Nick Westerman blade, but <laughs> you know, it's, I need all these tools for research purposes. So I need to, yeah. I need to do this for science only. So. This is a very high-tech protection device. So, so this is just a so this pattern been laser cut into the this a U handle and I chip carved it afterwards. Look, sadly I don't have um, access to laser cutter now. I would do really awesome stuff with it. But what I really enjoy about this project, you know, is how you mix things like really modern machinery or modern techniques uh, to traditional carving techniques can do some really nice mix and match with it um, and which is one of the things I really enjoy in this craft and I think as a maker as a designer you would call it that you know these traditional crafts have really led themselves to be lifted into different contexts and so that serves an inspiration Oh yeah, so um, this finishing knife I really enjoy because this curvature is perfect for my spoon, the actual shape of the ball. So you can do really nice shallow facets, I like carves, hollows with it. You can blend them together really nicely so you can get a really nice smooth ball finish. So you have quite a long handle on that spoon knife, don't you? Yes. Um, so the reason for that is um, Again, it's for leverage. So most people using their um, spoon knife like so, so they brace it, uh, brace the spoon against them, and they try cut this way. Um, so because you can carve along the grain, you can have a really nice finish this way. Uh, what I do is to instead of you know sometimes I cut right across if your knife is um, really sharp, but if I tilt it a little bit, I get a bit of a slicing motion. So you can cut across the grain and it just gets a little bit smoother. Um, yeah, I know I'm a little bit of a cheat. I'm only using this potato peeling technique with a spoon knife, but uh, it's really easy, really safe. The only danger really that you cut in your thumb, but if you get to the end of the cut and you're kind of like lifting it up and stopping it just in time, so I'm just gliding it on the surface, let it pick up all the high spots. I'm taking my time. The other way would be that I hide my thumb underneath the spoon so I can cut through without cutting my thumb. But this technique will come 
as you gain more and more experience, more and more control over your knife. So, um, where we are at. We have a really nice smooth ball. Um, it's a little bit to have a sharp rim in here, so I'm going to carve this off a little bit. Uh, apart from that, I'm quite happy with how the ball feels and looks. So, so I'm going to take off this sharp bit. By doing this as well, I'm making the um, the spoon ball a little bit flatter on the front. So I've been talked about that. It's quite important for a comfortable user experience. If I look from the profile, it's a bit of a steep drop and then there's a nice shallow, which would be ideal for a spoon. And now I created this flat bit again, so I'm going to go back with my spoon knife and blend it in nicely. But I will do this the same time as I do this section here because I'm going to recut that one more time. Um, now it's a good opportunity to finish off the back of the spoon and then I will match the bowl, match it with the handle to finish this off. Um, where we are at. So I'm going to come from a bit of an angle here. Same on the other side. So it's kind of dropping the rim. It's kind of create an apex, which is with this part here. This will be a great opportunity to run this facet all the way around here. I'm going to leave it for now. And I'm just trying to iron out all the, the high spots so, it's, so everything flows nicely. Again, because I left everything square, I always say this is the, if you take anything away, this is the best thing to take away from this video. <laughs> to keep everything nice and square on the side and on the back because it's so much easier to just look in and you can tell straight away if something is not quite right. So you can really blend in all the nice shapes and curves. So you see here, this one is a little bit higher than this one point a bit here, so I'm going to drop this. Not quite. That's better. Yeah, so good, 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 good. Let's do the neck a little bit thinner. Same technique, leave this little hairy bit there. And I come from the other side, just creep underneath them ever so slightly. Nice smooth transition. So I would say this is about the right thickness for the neck, so I get plenty of strength, but once I put these um, facets on the side it will appear even thinner, which will make a really nice elegant spoon. Um, so now I have a few design decisions to make, so one of them is how, what sort of details will, I will do here, uh, how the transition from the back of the bowl will go into the neck of the spoon, and what overall shape I'm looking at. So. Let's just get this profile cleaned up. All right, this flows quite nicely. And then this guy here. See, I have no template here, so you just have to go with the flow. So this is 
two baubles for my liking. So I'm gonna tone it down a little bit. So now I'm switched to my, um, it's a micro sloid, I saw a small sloid from Dave, Dave Cockroft. Um, and this is one of my <laughs> signature handles in a way. Anyway, this is a handle I really like at the moment. This is an evolution from the, from the previous ones I do. Um, so it's very similar. And in the video how to make a knife handle uh, I will explain why certain decisions have been made to, in regarding the shape and ergonomics. But um, this I'm extremely happy with, it feels amazing in the hand. Um, and yeah, but this knife, because of the really uh, narrow bevel of the blade and the angle of the bevel, it makes it amazing to do finishing cuts and do the facets on this knife, uh, on this uh, spoon. So I will use this for the upcoming section we will be um, giving a little bit more curvature for the handle so we have a nice sweep here uh, I will do that by establishing my main facets so I'm going to put him to, so you can have it like this as well, if you just keep dropping and it just comes to an apex. Um, so I'm checking the thickness, so the distance from the back of the, the spoon. And if it's flat in the same way. And then by removing the apex, Basically, as with the principle throughout, rather than taking one big chunk out, you're working in angles. Yes, but also I'm putting in, uh, I would like to have a faceted top here, so I'm putting in my main facets. These are going to be the guidelines when I'm getting to the finishing cuts in a way. So I'm going to just go again, re-establishing these. You can do because obviously with a knife, the sharp knife, is not an issue to take the whole thing off in one go and then now if you have, want to have facets I just take this line here and that line there I would usually do this uh, once the spoon is nice and dry you can have really nice crisp detail well because time is short I'm just going to do it now You won't be able to see it as well because it's not as sharp. And then I just go back on the window. So it's probably the camera won't pick it up that we have nice facets now. So it's a nice rounded surface. And we have a bit of a more curvature on the spoon here. Um, so now I need to tackle this. As I mentioned earlier, so this here, I'm just gonna blend it. So this facet blends into the handle like so. Same on the other side. So I have a bit of an apex here. If you want you can take this off and blend into the middle bit. So again this knife is really good to because it's still thin, so like narrow. It's really nice to get into really tight curves. I think this is one of the best, my personal opinion, finishing knife out there. And Dave is a wonderful craftsman. I 
I really enjoy using this knife. So I'm quite happy with the top. So I'm going to leave it at that. The danger of um, facets, you can always think of it is forever. You know, once you establish the main, we'll just leave it, and then you might go back to it once um, once it's dry. So we still have loads of material here around. This is a very basic design for the back of the spoon. Really easy to keep it symmetrical. It's kind of like a hollow here, have a little curve, which ideally shape follows this inside of the spoon to a certain extent until it comes to a high spot there. This side is a little bit trickier. And then this really nicely can run on the back of your spoon all across. Alright, so I'm just looking at the same thickness on either side. You see this side is a bit thicker. I'm going to take that down a little. Yeah, looking good. So, because I'm getting to the finishing cuts now, to take, taking that little thickness all the way around, I'm going to finish again <laughs> to get the really final, final finish on the ball. So in the front, I'm just running it right through the edge. It's kind of have a flat edge. What I mean by it doesn't have a rim like this. And as I progress further up the spoon, so it starts here with a certain thickness, I'm going to have thinner and thinner and thinner, and that all of a sudden just blends into the ball. which is usually either when the deepest point of the crank or how we feel comfortable but um, so now I'm going to use this technique again which I'm not as practiced in because I don't use it as often but for this is perfect so I get here until the grain direction changes Yeah, so you see here is nice and no border, no edge here, and then it starts building it up from here. There's some sort of chatter there, I'm gonna get rid of that. Yeah, and that's how the ball, the top part is finished. Go back to my finishing, actually now to this knife, because I'm gonna remove some more material And I'm now I'm going down to my final thickness. So what I do is just to get the thickness right all the way around, which is, don't know, two mil. 
it depends on the wood species you know if it's really soft wood leave it a bit thicker so it's, you know well, over time it will wear and tear obviously but with cherry you're quite safe and then because I just you know went really steep on the edge you just blend it in afterwards you can feel for the thickness so start from the top and blend it in nicely if you want this is a good stage to put in facets you need to leave a bit more material but, um, or if you want to have like a really uh, like a visible how the um, each cut made you can do a bit of a like so so we each cut would be more visible but on here we're just going for the nice smooth finish all right so I have a nice rim all the way around it's quite flat on the front as I was saying it so now because I messed up this kind of symmetry in here I need to tackle that I'm going to take down the thickness a little bit I have nice clean hands in the morning but you just can't keep it clean by the end of it at this point you know if it would be a really light colored wood I would probably go wash my hands because it picks up dirt from your hand all right so now I need to match these curves so I see I have a bit of an apex there so I can take that further down and I want matching curve as well So you're constantly stopping to look, assess? Yes, I think it's a good practice to pick up because first of all it should be something you enjoy doing um, but even if you're a production carver you know you can get things get a little bit like really hectic and really like out like on a conveyor belt kind of feeling but just have a look, have a stop, check for symmetry, assess the situation, whether you need to take off material um, just be a bit more conscious about your process uh, I'm trying to be methodical whatever I do um, because that will you know that helps you build habits that will help you along further down the line so one of them is to check check for a symmetry check what everything in line how it looks it's very much sculpting you know it's a three-dimensional object is 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 need to be right in all different dimensions uh, right thickness right profile functionality so it's good to be more aware of your process and it also helps you honing it and refining it um, what else yes yeah, so I'm going to next one I'm going to blend this you see I've got a bit of a high spot here a bit of a crude straight line so this is a very simple design in terms of uh, not having really wild facets on it or, or curves but this is a really good spoon in terms of functionality and enjoyment it's not too difficult to carve I'm gonna blend these guys in a little bit more And I might bring these closer. Yep, that's looking good. Do you approve? Looking good to me. Yeah, good. So I'm going to move on then. So I'm going to move on to the actual handle now. I'm quite happy with this part here. Move on to the handle. We got the top nailed down, so I'm going to do the back. 
So I have a few options here again. Either follow this curve on the top or round it off or anything in between. So I think I will just follow these facets and see what happens. Yeah, I think I will cut this off so it follows the top section. You know, it's constantly making design decisions or decisions on aesthetics. Some of them will work out, some of them won't. But it's one of those things you just learn to make good decisions by practicing and making many wrong ones. So I'm going back to the facets I did on the top and I'm going to join with another one starting from here and this facet will start you know melding into the one I will start from the bowl and it's just so pretty when you have these curly worldies start from there and you're trying to meat there I'm trying to get these symmetrical see this narrow tip is just really helps with these tight turns all right that's looking good that's looking good so the back is just a flat-ish, nothing special. Get this cleaned up. This is quite good to do as well when it's very dry. It's less fluffy. Um, and now to improve a little bit on the comfort of the spoon so I've got take off this sharp edge here and this one here just going all the way around you can go extreme you can have it like perfectly rounded off so when you say comfort, you mean in terms of actual use, putting it into the mouth? Yes, yeah. So you don't really want any sharp edges. Um, that definitely will reduce the uh, mouse feel. Yeah, when I was talking about mouse feel to my wife, she was burst out laughing. But <laughs> it is a term we spoon covers use, and it's quite important. And she do like. I did turn her to eat out from woodenware. And she do have a, her favorite spoon because it feels really nice in the mouth. It's really nice to use. And it's quite uh, good to investigate. You know, have a look at those spoons. Like a, a person who knows nothing about spoon carving and ask their opinion. So for the sake of research, do you think it's best to eat lots of cake with different spoons? Uh, yes, definitely. The more cake and more spoons you use, if you eat even one cake, try three different spoons, and if you only have one spoon, try, try three different cakes, just for see free, in the name of research, definitely. So yeah, I'm just now 
nitpicking on the uh, finish of the spoon. So I went around all the way here and I'm going to do the same thing on the back. So you see it's quite thick. Um, I can probably take it down a little bit thinner but which I will do here. But this will uh, have plenty of use, let's hope. Um, and now we can do this part here, it's not necessary, but just taking off sharp edges. And if you want, you can take, you know, depends on what sort of style you prefer. You can also take these off, um, shall we? Let's do that. And just blend it into the neck. Do the same thing on this side. So it just gives a bit of a more detail. So this kind of curve, like a fan. Um, and yeah, I think we're looking good. So we've got a very tip left. Um, you can leave it like this, just put it in a bit of an angle. Just something different. And then you can follow the facets from the front. Hmm, let's do it this way. Went a little bit heavy handed there. Actually, I like it better without breaking up the edges. Yeah, so something like this. So, Peter, a couple of questions left. So, firstly, drying. What's your personal process for drying at this stage? Uh, well, it's always different whatever you're using. If you're using a really large spoon or large piece of woodenware, um, it's better to dry them, obviously it's always better to dry them slowly, but if the wood is really green, so really well, full of moisture, it's better to dry them a little bit slower. So if you have something like I do that is um, it's outside but sheltered, it's just put it in there because it's roughly, the humidity is roughly the same as would be an outside air but because it's dry it's not raining on if you're drying really slowly uh, it will lose moisture eventually and then you can bring it inside if you want to you can bring it inside put in some wood shavings put in the paper bag uh, and then dry it that way so that should be a fairly safe way of drying it but when you have a like a eating spoon like this with no pith no crazy grain you usually just put it inside of your house and if it's not winter, not extremely dry and, and hot, it should dry naturally without cracking. But it's always nice to be keep on the safe side. You know, all this work, you don't want to put in the bin because a big crack develops. And finally, oiling. What's your personal uh, preference for oiling? Uh, that's the tricky one because I'm not happy with... Um, I usually use linseed oil, but I really don't like how it's yellowing everything. So I've been in the lookout for um, an alternative um, you have obviously the mineral oils, which they're not polymerizing, so not curing. But um, I looked into those, but not with not much success. So I think at the moment I would stick with linseed oil because it's easy to get and it's readily available. Make sure it's um, you know cold pressed, fresh linseed oil. It's not the boiled stuff, full of chemicals, uh, which will polymerize and create a nice protective layer on your spoon if you leave it long enough to cure. Um, yeah, I would say linseed oil at the moment. So there you have it, my friends. That is a wrap for this video. Peter, thank you so much. No problem. That was amazing. Was this the first time you've taught on video? Uh, not really. I have to be honest, not the first time, but haven't been many. So yeah. I'm, still, I'm still quite a beginner at this. You're a really good teacher. <laughs> and I mean it much. in a completely non-sarcastic way, <laughs> very seriously, like seriously. 
Well, I typically go quiet on these videos. That means he's doing a good job. <laughs> That's good, yeah. So seriously, you know, um, it's not easy with me standing with this big camera in your yeah. face, right? <laughs> Definitely. Um, and trying to act natural, right? So yeah. honestly, seriously, that was really good. As I always say with complete sincerity, whenever I film all of these videos with people like yourself, it's always a learning experience for me. Yeah. I'm always learning things. I'm always getting an insight to, oh, wow, okay, it's interesting. So even though I'm filming for you guys, I'm learning also. So that was really insightful. So I really do appreciate you sharing that. Uh, thank, thank you, you so very much, much for the opportunity. So a few party words. Number one, a reminder. There is a breakdown of all the sections of this video along the timestamp on this YouTube video. Um, so you can click to any particular section that you uh, would prefer to go to as you're following through after watching this video the first time round. Secondly, there's also a breakdown of the timestamp in the description as well. If you click on the time part of it, YouTube has this really funky feature where it will jump straight to that section. So that's another way is also jump into any particular segment of the video you want to recap on or you would like to delve into further. Um, a final reminder also that uh, Peter has very kindly put together a template very similar to the spoon he's carved in this video that he's made available for you to download for free. So I'm gonna put a link to that in the description and also pin to the top of the comments. Now on that page there's about two, three, four things that are going on. Number one, you can download the template for the spoon that he's carved in this video. Secondly, he's put a quick breakdown as a recap of the tools that are used in this video and where to get them from. Now obviously needless to say that the amazing axe is made by Peter himself and the rest of the tools he's linked to in that blog post also. Um, thirdly, do you sell your spoons? There's something I forgot to ask you. Yes, I do, but um, I would like to make more, but I don't really have time for them. So when they, when I finish one, I put it up for sale so you can, they're available on my website. So. Um, and the final thing is mailing list. Do you have a mailing list? I do, yes. So if you go on solwoodcreation.com, which is my name as well, uh, go in and sign up for a newsletter, you will know everything about tools, when they're going to be available, spoons and all the other things I make. So it will become available and you will be notified straight away. So on that same page as well, they've got the ability to, to join your email newsletter. Yes. So basically, if you go to that one link, everything is there. Should you have any questions or queries? And it's just our way of saying thank you to Peter for allowing me to come here, document his entire process for you to learn. What I'm also gonna do is put a link to Peter's Instagram down below. Alternatively, just look for Soulwood Creations. Um, Peter regularly documents everything he has going on. Like I mentioned before, he's a full-time tool maker and green woodworker, and his work is amazing no matter what he puts his hand to. You also make tools for other people as well, don't you? In terms of handles. Yes, You yeah. put handles on yeah, people's absolutely. tools. Um, so you can see the myriad of things that he has going on. So Instagram's also a great way of seeing his back catalog of his work, so you can get a lot more deeper insights into the spoons, the axes, tool handles, etc. that Peter makes. And the final reminder, there's a lot of reminders here, so as a final reminder, this is part of a mini-series I'm filming with Peter on his visit down to see him here in West Yorkshire. So we've got two videos on knife handles, part one on knife handle ergonomics, and part two where from start to finish, um, Peter will carve a handle talking about why he's doing what he's doing, all the way to a finished product where he actually inserts the blade as well. And similar with the axe as well. He's gonna talk about axe handle ergonomics, as well as from start to finish, completely carve a handle from scratch, as well as fitting an axe head. All of that I'm really eager to see myself also. Should be good Your fun. entire process. So links to all of those will be down below in the description. One final question before we depart. This is something I'm really genuinely curious about. Obviously you have Hungarian heritage. Yes. Is there any history of spring carving within Hungary itself? Well, there is a certain history which is probably similar to every other country that, you know, back in the days when all the, uh, you know, peasants or all the uh, people lived off the land, they carved their own woodenware, so there is massive uh, culture in that, but it's kind of died off as the industrialization and all these uh, ceramic and metal kitchenware came in. Uh, you can still find it in Transylvania, which is used to be part of uh, Hungary, but now part of Romania. There's uh, pockets of villages like full of Hungarians who are still practicing these um, ball day turning and spoon carving. Um, at the moment, I think it's quite an extinct kind of tradition or, or craft. There's still a few pockets, there's a few prominent um, people in Hungary who do spoon carving, who one of them is um, 
after Robin Wood met one of these uh, people in, uh, in Hungary and he been shown how to finish, um, well legend has it, how to finish um, a spoon with a knife instead of just scraping it or sending it. So there is really hidden pockets but not really, not as prominent in England or as I hear it from the States or any other countries. Excellent, no I appreciate you sharing that, it's something I've been, I was really <laughs> curious about the whole time I thought you know, so I really do appreciate you sharing that. No so guys that is a recap for this video, once again links for everything down below in the description. If you have any questions or queries for Peter, the best way to contact him is using Instagram, I'll put a link below, uh, down to that below also. Can they contact you for your website if they have any questions or queries? Uh, yes, it's just my email address is there. So it's quite easy. Perfect, you can contact him through there. So Peter, once again, a sincere thank you thank for you demonstrating much. your process. Guys, hope you enjoyed this video. And that is a wrap. And as always, I hope whatever you're doing, you have a blessed day, a blessed week ahead. From Peter Kovac and myself, Zed Outdoors, peace out.